Hi everyone, this is the CircuitPython Weekly for the week of November 15th, 2021. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Dan, I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. I work on the CircuitPython core in particular. CircuitPython is a version of Python that's designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Um, CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and support CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord, and you'll uh, get a, that URL lets you go enter the server on Discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern time in the U.S., 11 a.m. Pacific time in the U.S., except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. There are a lot of U.S. holidays on Mondays. If the meeting time is changed, we'll notify you by, via Discord. If you wish to be notified about changes to the meeting, we can add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There is also a calendar available in Google Calendar that we try to keep updated if you'd like to subscribe to that. This meeting is recorded. We record audio from the voice channel and video from the text channel. If you'd rather not have your voice recorded, you are still welcome to participate. The video of this meeting will be posted to YouTube after the meeting is over and the audio will be released as a podcast. If you find this podcast is not available on your favorite podcast service, please let us know. There is a notes doc to accompany the meeting and recording. If you wish to participate but can't make it to the meeting, you can leave hug reports and status updates for us in the document and we'll be read them off during the meeting. Um, okay, and I will, I've already explained a bunch of the other stuff, uh, so we'll just go on from here. Let me put a link to the notes doc in the in the chat. There you go. Okay, I'll take his timestamp and we'll start with community news. Um, oh, I'm putting a timestamp in some in the wrong place. Hold on a second. Okay, first we'll go over some community news, which will be in the CircuitPython newsletter, which comes out um, to, tomorrow. Um, we've got the top, sort of the headline new items from, from the newsletter here. Uh, the first one is that CircuitPython 7.1.0 beta 0 is now available. It's the initial beta release for CircuitPython 7.1.0. It is relatively stable, but it contains issues we may still address for 7.1.0. So uh, there's a list of things that have been added to 7.1.0 since 7.0.0, uh, most notably uh, keypad.events now has timestamps. The Express port now provides some additional features, I2C peripheral, Wi-Fi uh, monitor mode, ESP32C3 support initially, and parallel image capture support. Uh, there are some additions to bitmap tools. There's preliminary support for async IO. You can use the CircuitPython async IO library, which will be in the bundle soon. Um, and I'm writing a guide for that. Uh, GIF IO for, um, for uh, writing GIF uh, uh, images is available now. HID now provides boot device and feature report support. Rotary IO now lets you set number of clicks per, uh, or the, the, the number of counts per transition. Um, the SAMD port now has watchdog and uh, alarm with sleep support. Uh, the STM port now supports the STM32 LR45, L4R5 chip. And we've merged in the latest uh, release from MicroPython, which is 1.17. Our next news item is about Make Magazine. Um, Make Magazine issues are now available on Internet Archive. There's a link in the notes. Um, 
there's, uh, if I understand properly, it's sort of like a lending library. A certain number of people can check out a copy, and when you're done, you return it to the Internet Archive. So it's basically like a public library. Uh, there's a limited number of copies, and uh, that's how you control how many people can look at it at once. Um, the PyCast um, uh, sort of podcast or video podcast in the last one, um, Scott was on, and um, he joined Tom to the Tom's Hardware Podcast to talk about a new version of the programming language that boots up on bare metal Raspberry Pi without a host OS like Raspbian required. Uh, and also in this uh, issue of uh, the podcast, Les Pounder showed off the new version of the Raspberry Pi OS named Bullseye. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit more about the, the weekly newsletter. The CircuitPython weekly newsletter is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are available uh, on uh, adafruitdaily.com. It highlights the latest Python and hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. You can contribute your own news or project to uh, the newsletter. You can make a pull request on GitHub to the repo for the weekly newsletter. You can also uh, tag a tweet in Twitter with pound circuit Python if you want, and we'll notice it. Or you can email cpnews at adafruit.com. Any of those ways will get us, uh, will get the material into the newsletter for the next week. Okay, now our next main section is um, State of Circuit Python, the libraries in Blinka. This says what how we're doing in terms of development and fixing bugs and adding features. So overall, in the past week, there were 122 pull requests merged. Um, a lot of new authors, um, including URF DVW, Rezal Manda, Emerge Reanimator, M. A. Filtenborg, Labruska, Zebular 13, and Nosferato Jr. Uh, are new people we haven't seen before, we think. There were 19 authors, 10 reviewers, and 17 issues were closed by 12 people, and 13 issues were opened by nine people. So we're ahead of the game in terms of uh, closing issues. Um, in the CircuitPython core, take another timestamp, uh, we had 17 pull requests merged by 11 authors, five reviewers. We still got 15 open pull requests. A bunch of those are drafts or are awaiting um, 800, um, the initial versions of 800, so they'll stick around for a while. But 15 isn't too bad, and I think a few have been closed recently since this list was made. Six issues were closed by five people, and seven issues were opened by four people. So we've got 450 open issues right now. Um, there are 22 issues that are still uh, open for, we hope to fix in some version of CircuitPython 7. We've got eight issues that are deferred until 8.00. Um, and we've got 398 long-term issues and some other miscellaneous issues. Only one issue is not assigned a milestone. We'll fix that. Our next um, section is the state of the libraries. Uh, and Katni, are you available to talk about that? I am, if you can hear me. I can hear you. Yep. Great. So um, this applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a couple of extras like our uh, cookie cutter and the community bundle. So over the last week, um, across all of these repos, we had 104 pull requests merged from eight different authors and seven reviewers. Uh, one of those PRs was 107 days old, which is good to see that we're still getting through some older ones. Um, I deleted the full list. It was multiple pages long. There is a link to our report uh, if you wish to see all of those merged PRs. And that leaves us with 58 open pull requests. There were 10 issues closed by seven people and six opened by six people, leaving us with 627 open issues. 259 of those are labeled good first issue. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, visit circuitpython.org contributing. 
You'll find this information and more, uh, open pull requests and open issues. And you can search the issues by label. If you're new to everything, check out Good First Issues. Those are a great place to start. Um, and if you're looking for something more complicated, check out Bug or Enhancement. Uh, find an issue that interests you, comment on it that you're working on it. If you need help from us, we have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub. And we're also always available both via GitHub and Discord. So feel free to pop into Discord and uh, post your question or um, post it on the issue that you are choosing to work on. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, there were no new libraries, but a number of updated libraries. And you will see next week, that list will also have to be deleted um, because we just did a ma major update and all of the releases are being done today. So overall, we finished a series of library updates, including an update to PyLint to run 2.11.1, an update that forces older libraries read the docs to run the latest Sphinx, an update to the pre-commit config to include disabling PyLint consider using f-strings, and um, duplicate code for examples and tests. Where necessary, we also disable duplicate code for the library code as well. We reverted the increase to the min similarity lines, which is what uh, the threshold that must be met to trigger the duplicate code check. Um, and so we know where there are duplicate code issues in the libraries and we can address that at a later date. Um, I didn't get to finish typing this out, but a community member is still going through all of the type hint PRs. So expect to continue to see those. Um, and uh, basically the, we shouldn't have to do another update like this in, in a, for a while, which is about how it goes. Um, and I guess that's about where we're at. Okay, thank you very much, Katni. Okay, uh, Maker Melissa, are you available to do the Blinket update? I am, if you can hear me. Yep. Uh, okay, so Blinket is our, our CircuitPython compatible layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And this week we had one pull request merged by one author and one reviewer. Uh, there were there are three open pull requests still, um, and there was one closed issue by one person and zero open by zero people, leaving a net of 64 open issues amongst all the repos. There were 13,372 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we are currently supporting 77 boards. And that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Melissa. Okay, now we'll go on to Hug Reports. Uh, hug reports are where we um, recognize contributions to CircuitPython and its libraries from the community. And people uh, usually have particular people they want to thank. So I'll start and we'll go down the list then back around to the top. Um, uh, I'd like to thank Tetrick, who's, who's done all kinds of library and documentation fixes in the past week or so. A tremendous amount of output. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank uh, Jeff Epler, who did a whole a flurry of PRs to the core just before he left for a short break. Um, it was we got, had a lot of stuff to review over the weekend. Thank you very much, Jeff. He's not here today. Okay, Foamy Guy, who's not here right now, so I'll read their contributions. Uh, thanks to Jeff for finding and reporting an issue with the library example screenshot utility, and Dan H for reviewing the PR to fix it. That's the images that. Uh, look like screenshots from the Mac in particular in guides, but they're actually generated programmatically. So we can change them easily. Uh, thanks to GitHub user Tetrick for continuing to submit PRs for typing information and other things. Thanks to GitHub user 560 for submitting typing information for the APDS 9960 library and working through feedback on the PR for that. Thanks to Katni for looking into an issue with PyLint config, testing out some solutions and providing guidance. And thanks to Mark Gambler for working on display IO support for LED matrix classes. Okay, uh, Jerry, you can go ahead if you're ready. I am, uh, hi. Let's see, uh, so uh, yeah, hugged everybody involved in the BLE workflow, the PyLeap and Glider stuff. So really cool new stuff, fun to play with. And to uh, Adafruit for all the, the new ESP32S2 Feather toys and everybody involved in 7.1 beta release. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Jerry. Okay, Katni. All right. So I have a list here. 
First up, uh, hug report to Dylan for getting through the pilot update um, and all the other various updates I just listed off in the library section. Um, there was a lot going on and every time we did a patch, I thought of something else we might as well patch while we were at it. So there were a lot of patches. And um, for those who are not aware of the process, uh, sometimes those patches skip certain libraries. So there's always cleanup afterwards. Um, so it, it's not quite so simple as just applying the patch and everything's good to go. So there's always cleanup. Um, thanks to Tectric for a ton of help with getting the libraries that were missed in the patch updated with the patch code, for being so patient with learning our CI and processes, and for working through the type hint issues. To Foamy Guy for thoroughly reviewing type hint PRs and asking thoughtful questions. To Keith the EE and Mark Gambler for helping with reviewing the final pilot PRs. To uh, PT and Adafruit IT for getting me set up with an Adobe Stock subscription to make doing guide images in a non-potential copyright violating manner much simpler. Um, it turns out just because it says it's free on Google doesn't mean it's free. Not that there's actually been an issue for me, but this is just you know, common understanding. Um, so it's not great to use images that aren't obviously licensed. And now I have access to tons of stuff that is officially licensed. Um, so I don't have to scramble to dig around anymore. Um, to Jeff for writing me a script to combine the two CSV files available for my Adafruit order history, which are order history and products history. Um, the script combines the two so I can go through and identify every product shipped to a specific address. Um, neither one of those things has enough information, but the two combined has, has plenty. And finally, to Jeff for teaching me how to do nested with statements. I have already been able to share that with somebody else, and so I'm far more likely to remember it. Thank you very much. That's what I've got. Thank you, Katni. OK, uh, Melissa, can you go ahead? OK, uh, I wanted to just give a group hug to everyone. OK, thanks. OK, and uh, Mark, uh, if you're on, if you're available. Oh, he's lurking. So I'll just say, um, I'll read Mark's. Uh, Mark, thanks Paint Your Dragon for all the original IS31 code I learned from, and a group hug because I know I am forgetting others. And now we'll move on to Scott. Hello. Um, first, a hug report to Katni for the welcome to CircuitPython revamp, and also for jumping in to help with the PyLeap content. I'm excited to get more guides in there. So thank you for jumping into that, um, or leaping into that, should I say. <laughs> uh, hug report to Trevor and Antonio for their work on PyLeap and File Glider uh, accordingly. And also a shout out to Maker Melissa for all of their work on code.circuitpython.org, which is very exciting. And we're just starting to see this push to all these new stuff. And I'm excited for people to try it. So thank you all. OK, thank you, Scott. We'll wrap around to the top. I'll read Anecdata's Who Was Lurking. Uh, thanks, Microdev, for the completion of the monitor PR. ESP, ESP, ESP32 S2 safe mode fixes in review of the MAC address PR. And thanks to Jepler for help with type hints and finding a bug while doing so. OK, uh, C. Grover is also text only. So I'll read theirs as soon as I take another time code or a previous time code, approximately. Um, C. Grover says, thanks to the team for the 7.1 beta release and group hope to the team and community. OK, that wraps up hug reports. We'll move on to status updates. Uh, I'll start. Um, uh, main, one of the main things I did last week was make a CircuitPython 7.1.0 beta 0 release. Uh, thanks to S. Kerr, I forgot to say, who did in, some initial work on that. That was uh, quite helpful. So there were a zillion changes. There were something like 100 um, things to put in. I believe, but try out 7.1.0 beta 0 if you get a chance. And I've started working on an async IO learn guide with an overview of what cooperative multitasking is, and I'll give some simple examples. OK, uh, Foamy Guy is not here, so I'll read theirs. Uh, Foamy Guy is reviewing more type PRs. They've debugged and fixed an issue resulting in extra blank lines in the library example screenshots we talked about before. And outside of CircuitPython, 
Foamy Guy is diving into Phaser 3, the Phaser 3 JavaScript game engine a bit, ultimately hoping to use what I learned to make a game that is played in a browser on a PC and controlled by a Pi gamer connected via USB. Okay, uh, Jerry, are you ready now? I am. Uh, let's see, so still on a pretty limited time availability due to being called back to work, but hopefully I'll be wrapping that up soon and at least it pays for some new toys. Um, let's see. So I did play with the PyLeap and Glider. They uh, they they worked really well as you know out of out of the box. Uh, it's fun to see them working. And um, and I just got some of the new ESP32 S2 feathers. I want to give a quick report. A couple of things I, I stumbled across and. Um, from what I can tell, <laughs> I can't get them to trigger into a UF2 bootloader. So uh, I was talking with Katni, there seems to be some thought that there is one on there, but I sure couldn't get it to trigger. So what I ended up doing was erasing the uh, loading circuit Python, you know, directly. Um, but I found that when I did that, I had to first erase the flash first and then load circuit Python or else circuit Python wouldn't boot. And um, I've seen that before on ESP32 S2s. So just a heads up to anyone else. Um, if you can get the bootloader to work, great. But I couldn't. <laughs> and um, I haven't tried loading the bootloader to it yet. That would be another thing. And then another funny little thing that, that occurred on the boards that have the built-in BME280, I'm seeing or had was seeing this intermittent OS error, error 19, unsupported operation. Sometimes it would happen after it, it ran. I was running the BME280 simple test. And um, sometimes it would work for a cycle, and then it would give this error. Sometimes it would give the error right away. It tried to be a code.py or be a REPL. It's totally unpredictable, and now I can't reproduce it. So I don't know. I'll keep If I can reproduce it, I'll put an issue in somewhere. But it's just so, again, if anyone is playing with those boards, let me it'd be interested to see if you run into any of these issues. And then um, I did last week um, upgraded some Raspberry Pis to Bullseye and some interesting things there, again, for people should be aware of. Um, I found Blinker worked great, but on the BrainCraft, the Pi TFT support broke because they made a fundamental change to camera support. The old Raspi Still and Raspi Vid are, are gone. And so it, that, that didn't work. And a lot of other things that I have are broken out from that. Um, there's a lot of information out there on the Raspberry Pi forums. I posted a link. Um, there is a potential workaround that I just haven't had a chance to try yet. But if anybody's upgrading to Bullseye, just beware. There's some. There's a, a supposedly a very good new camera support, Lib Camera, but um, it's just you know old some older stuff won't work. Good luck. Okay, thank you, Jerry, and your feline assistant. So. Yes, <laughs> willing to help. All right, uh, Katni, go ahead. Such perfect timing on that last meow. All right, so last week, finished up the Welcome to Circuit Python guide update. I may have mentioned it last week. Um, it's still uh, awaiting um, final moderation. It's super huge, so I understand why it's still awaiting final moderation. It's going to be a bit of a task to go through, so there's still one page that's not published. Um, I updated Cookie Cutter to include the Read the Docs fix, worked with Dylan to patch the libraries with the Read the Docs fix, put in a few pilot PRs and learned something new in the process. Thanks again to Jeff. Started the guide for the new monochrome 1.12 inch 128 by 128 OLED. I'm now, well, I'm no longer waiting for it to arrive because it's here, but um, was waiting for the hardware to be able to continue. Um, approve the final pilot PRs and identified seven Circuit Playground Bluefruit examples that would be ideal for PyLeap. Submitted all the code to the Learn Repo and started working on the guides for each of them. Um, they each need a separate guide because that's just how PyLeap works. And there are three out of seven done. Um, they're not public yet, but that'll be soon. So this week I'm going to be finishing up the PyLeap guides. Um, I'm going to start the Feather ESP32 S2 guide. Finish the monochrome OLED guide. Uh, make sure that existing pretty pins diagrams are in all the guides and repos they're supposed to be. Um, a whole bunch of them got made when they when when Philby and Lamore were working on pretty pins and they never got put where they were supposed to be. So um, I have all the files for those. They just need to be uploaded to various places. Um, update the pretty pins readme to include instructions for using pretty pins. It currently just has a couple of um, 
couple of uh, commands to run. It doesn't actually tell you what any of it means or how to get set up for it or what files you need to do it, et cetera. And then that is also in preparation to get Dylan spun up on doing pretty pins and also unrelated spin up Dylan on creating fritzing objects. And um, I also cannot get these two Feather ESP32 S2s into the bootloader, um, even with the purple LED, which is supposed to be the indicator of when to um, when to tap reset. So I will look into um, why that is, but I just wanted to let Jerry know that it's not you. Um, and I tried one with the BME and one without. I mean, they're the same board. It's not, shouldn't have made a difference, but it doesn't. So that is um, what I've got. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Okay, uh, Melissa, you can go ahead. Hello. Um, so last week I fixed the Pi TFT installer uh, for the updated Raspberry Pi OS Bull Bullseye release. And uh, I wrote a guide for using the new circuit Python code editor, which is now in moderation. And uh, this week I'm going to be working on adding uh, missing boards to circuitpython.org. I'm actually working on that uh, now. And uh, I'm going to update Raspberry Pi Blinka setup guide with using the Python extended bus library because a few people have requested um, that feature not knowing that was available. Uh, I'm going to maybe work on some circuitpython.org issues or maybe start another guide. I'm not sure yet after that. And that's it. Okay, thank you. Okay, Scott, you can go ahead. Hello. So uh, last week, I got CircuitPython running on the zero, Pi Zero 2 W, which was exciting. Uh, so basically, it's in parity, at parity with what I've got on the Pi 4 going. Uh, it's not perfect, so the SD card support nearly works. I'm able to flash a new file system, and that's really good. But the problem is, is that I enabled mass storage over USB, and somehow the accesses over USB are causing some problems. So uh, I'm going to have to figure out why that is. Um, that's my some of my work this week. I figured out uh, how to generate image files that can be flashed with Imager or Etcher as you tried. Um, so that'll be a great way for us to distribute it. And hopefully we can convince the Raspberry Pi folks to actually have in the Imager uh, a, a subcategory for CircuitPython. So be really easy for people to to pick that. Um, so this week, uh, I'm hoping and hoping and hoping and hoping to fix these bugs that make USB unreliable so that we can have kind of the full workflow going. Um, on top of that, I, I, there's a little bit more polish to do before we do a first uh, first merge and getting it into circuitpath.org slash downloads. We'll need to pull up the board def polish up the board definition so it has all the pins with all the different names. Uh, I want to make it so that displays can be reinitialized at different resolutions and that uh, board.display exists so that you can do more than just see the serial output. And then after that, uh, probably after that, uh, I want to add a page to circuitpython.org for the BLE uh, stuff. So we we do have PyLeap and FileGlider available as test flight, uh, which is a link that you click. And then if you, you install the test flight app and that then installs these other apps uh, for you to try. It's pretty easy. And I posted some links in CircuitPython Dev last week. Um, so if you want to try out these new two, two new apps, PyLeap and FileGlider, let me know. Um, but I do hope to get a page on CircuitPython.org that links to those two apps and also to code code.circuitpython.org as well um, this week too. So I've just I'm kind of obsessed about getting this PyLeap, or the, not the PyLeap, the Raspberry Pi stuff, quote unquote, done so that we can get it in. So I'll probably just go heads down on that to get started. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm at. Okay. Trying to do other things when my brain can't. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> okay. All right, now we'll wrap around to the top. Um, I'll read C. Grover, who's text only. Um, C. Grover added three new scalable object classes to the display.io widget library. 
One is a 10 segment stackable bar graph based on the LM391X family of bar dot display drivers, a stripable NeoPixel object, and a stackable four digit seven segment LED bubble display module based on the HP35 calculator display. And uh, C. Grover gives a link to a demo on YouTube if you'd like to see that. Um, also, the newest widget objects are working using absolute display addressing. Next step is to convert to normalized addressing to provide display size independence as with the existing scale and magic eye objects. Three more widgets are planned for the library, an analog clock dial, a traditional 90 degree analog panel meter, and a horizontal edge view analog meter. And C. Grover hasn't been able to start working on the new display IO arc method to draw arcs, perhaps sometime later this week. So these widgets all sound like some fantastic synthesizer kind of uh, panel display is in, the, is in the offing, I guess. OK, thanks for that, C. Grover. So if we're now done with uh, status updates. We're moving on to the in, to in the weeds section. Um, so Scott, you're up first. Uh, yes. Um, thank you. I'm sorry. I'm trying to debug. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I was listening to this podcast called um, Changelog, and they had a person who was working on some project that I've forgotten. Um, but they mentioned that they're using orbit.love, which is a uh, kind of a community tracker um, as a way to keep track of like who the most engaged people in their community are. And they also have some, it also does some metrics around uh, like folks that were active that are no longer as active, kind of like coming into your community or leaving your community. And uh, I did actually set it up for Discord already um, for CircuitPython. But before I uh, pulled some other sources of data, I wanted to get a read of everybody's comfort level if we have a central place that potentially like links people's accounts across services. Um, so th this would allow us to say like, this person on Discord is also this person on GitHub and we can kind of like score or keep track of their involvement across those two platforms. Uh, before before I did that, I wanted to run it by people to see if you're comfortable with that or not. Are, um, do people set up their own associations? Like I don't think so. So these are these. So what it what it can be doing is it can uh, it it like suggests merges. So I've gotten some false positives in terms of like, uh, yeah, <laughs> I've gotten some false positives uh, from like Discord names that are the same. I've gotten some merge options for that. Um, I don't know if orbit.love allows like for opt-in by each user. I'm also, we can do it as a team, although at some point it becomes kind of a paid thing um, where we could actually get more people. Otherwise, I, I'm happy to also do it in terms of just like, let me know that you're okay with that and then um, either I can give you access or um, or we can do that. So I'm, I'm okay kind of like doing it on an opt-in basis, but I don't know how much it will try to automatically do for me if I do actually do it on like the Adafruit GitHub repos. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about all this. Okay, I mean, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> yeah. Um, if anybody wants, so I, I do have it set up with Discord only, and I can add teammates. So if you're interested in just taking a look at it uh, in more detail, let me know, and I'll I can add people as teammates to take a look at it too. Um, but I know that we do kind of track community involvement anyway. Um, yeah, that's right. Oh my Z shell, that's when they mentioned it. So. Um, yeah. So I don't have to do it, I, I, but I know that we do kind of sometimes do want to track uh, how many people are involved. So um, I'm okay not doing this. I think it is going to be more work, but uh, there is potentially some interesting kind of cross-service stuff that we could see. 
Yeah, so I think maybe we should just, I mean, I would say let's go ahead and look at it independently and then think about it. And I think yeah. we don't have to do the cross-service thing. I think the statistics that we might get, like GitHub's involvement statistics are kind of hard to understand sometimes. Mm -hmm. And Discord and it, also, it's, that stuff is publicly available from the API probably, but if it's if it's in a nicely digested format, that can be interesting. So, Yeah, and they do have this notion of workspaces, so it's possible we could actually create like separate workspaces for different services, so we could at least like aggregate all GitHub involvement across our repos together, but not necessarily connecting that to Discord. Yeah. Um, I think that would be doable if, if we found that to be helpful. Um, so yeah, let me know if you want to be added as a teammate. I, I've only set it up to suck in Discord data, um, which I think is okay because I think people need to treat Discord as a public thing. <laughs> um, because anybody can join it and anybody can get access to what, what's going on there. So. Uh, yeah, go ahead and just reach out to me and let me know what you think if you want to try it or if you want to uh, make sure that that we don't have anything happen there. Um, but I, it's also not super high on my list. I just thought it was potentially an interesting tool for us. OK, are there other comments about this that anyone has? OK, well, thanks, Scott. I think we'll all look at it and think about yeah, that's about fine. it. Yeah. Okay, um, Mark, are you available to do your section? Yes, I am. Uh, so I put in the draft PR for the IS31 driver, and I've got a few questions, and I understand that most people probably haven't had a chance to look at it, so some of these might just be deferred, but I put it in draft because there are some finishing polishes that I just wasn't sure the best direction to go that I wanted to put out there. Um, so more to bring these up as questions I still have than to necessarily get an answer today. So the first was, right now, should this be in the core? And then what board should it be turned on for? Um, I have seemed to have got a lot of response that people like this. So I'm thinking the answer is yes to the first one. Right now, the PR only has it turned on for the one eyeglass-specific board. Um, I'm not sure how much space it's going to take in the end. So is it worth enabling it for more boards or not? I, th I think we would need to know how much space it is overall. And I haven't looked at the NRF boards. And I guess it's not just NRF boards, it's any board. Yeah, it should work uh, with any. Right now, I've only tested it on the NRF board. Yeah, I mean, it's obvious that it should go on the LED driver board. It might be one of those things as like, if you don't have that and you want it, like we have the building circuit Python learn guide, then it's not hard to turn on. Yeah, um, that's what I kind of was thinking as well. Because we have the demo on PyLeap with the circuit playground blue fruit, maybe that would be a, a second board to have it on by default. Um, but I don't know what our space situation for that is. It's something I can look at as well, just to sort yeah. of get an idea. Mm -hmm. um, so the next one, I think I know the answer to, but was for these matrices of LEDs, there's a mapping for those that don't know that basically pixel zero, zero is LED eight, nine and 10 for RGB. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this changes board or display board. So the glasses has one mapping versus the others. So my thought is just to pass this in as potentially an array to the initialization. Does that seem to make sense? Pass it. Yeah. Mapping. We, you mean, okay. Yeah. Well, pass the mapping in. Okay. Well, I would, I would probably just do it as a big byte. Array oh yeah. Or, like you do want to, it's not something that a lot of people are going to have to manipulate, and it's something that you're going to want to make sure is kind of compact. And as I thought towards the end, part of stealing my thunder for question four was 
would a helper Python library be worthwhile in this case? And I'm thinking yes, because then we can provide mm -hmm. here is the mapping. So you're not trying to map 300 pixels yourself. Right. OK, that would make sense. I'll put in something for that. Um, this is one I was less sure on the best way to go is for the gamma table, which is fairly necessarily to make it look good is it's hard coded in the Arduino, Arduino driver into, but of course would increase build size. I, it can be calculated in Ram. So it's kind of a trade off Ram versus build size. It's 256 bytes. Uh, so I'm not sure what the best way to go is. That's pretty small from a firmware point of view. So unless you think that somebody needs to change the gamut, like, do you think that's something that's something that people want to vary? That was my only thought is if you wanted to vary the gamma value, it's hard coded into the Arduino as well as I think the ex exponent was 2.6 and tends to work fairly well. But if it's calculated at runtime, then of course it can be varied. So are there variants on the LEDs like different um, not that I've heard of before, but okay. I'm not an expert in this area. The other thing we've seen in the past, like sometimes the manufacturer changes the process or the, like we've gotten like WS2812s or SKs, I can't remember, like they changed and they got brighter or dimmer or something. And so uh, that's a reason to make it flexible in the future in case there's some manufacturing change in it. Um, I think either making it, 256 is fine on either the RAM or the, or the firmware size. I don't think it makes a lot of difference. So you might do the more flexible one. Well, I would, I would say, I, I would say do this, do the flash one, do, do the easiest thing first. Like, just yeah, that. that's the thought. It's easy enough to change later. Yeah. That, yeah. and, and the thing that, I w what 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 was I doing like this? There was some other thing that I kind of had the same trade off, and you also have to account for that if you're generating it and putting it in RAM, you're actually adding code size. Um, so that 256 bytes is not competing against zero flash space; it's competing about against how much code size gets added to store the code that generates the table. Um, so, so the difference is going to be less than 256 bytes. So I would just say, do the simplest thing. Um, okay. That one makes sense. Yeah. And I, the last, sorry. I was just gonna say, I don't know how much big that, how big that code would be, but my guess is not that small. If it starts being configurable, it'll grow in size. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a separate reason to do it in RAM. And the final one. Gave, this is the one that I'm not sure if there's a good answer to today is things like the eyeglasses ring lights. And it might be only this board that ever has this where it's like there's the display matrix, but there's still other LEDs on the board. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice to be able to control both, but I, there's no real way to map that into the display IO because it's dealing with a screen type object. The only thing I can think is that the Python, a Python library that at least knows that the I2C for the, the display is also going on and can kind of balance the two. This might be a for later type deal. So right I now think... the library doesn't do any, your module doesn't do anything with those? No, it, it treats it as an 18 by five display. Okay because they don't map nicely into an X, Y coordinate. Yeah. I haven't really played with running both the Python <laughs> uh, driver and this at the same time. In theory, they should work because they're both just sharing the same bus. Um, you have a bit of a race condition over initialization, whichever is initialized first gets the final say. But again, that shouldn't matter. I'm thinking yeah. about this one a little bit more because for my 
what I hope to finally do with this code myself, I would like the ring lights going, so. I wonder, I, my brain kind of went to the like, what if you made the ring lights like separate rows in the display frame buffer? The problem is the ring lights are 24 pixels yeah. or 23. So it doesn't, I, I thought the same doesn't thing. Divide if, evenly. if they were both 18, then sure. But I wonder if what you do is because you have, you're introducing a new object for this, right? Yes. Or maybe I haven't, I haven't looked at it, but that's, yeah. Maybe what you want to do is actually present a pixel buff on that object one maybe one for each eye or whatever whatever the python library does in terms of like because it, it it produces a pixel buff equivalent right like yeah the only thing i thought there was there are other uh boards that use this chipset which actually is a question i had while i was right. talking in this is i i think it makes sense to keep this a little bit generic Well, you, th it, you threw me off by the fact that you wanted it to work. <laughs> well, and it can be something that I, I can keep poking at after. Like if it isn't sort of a make it, break it for now, yeah. but it's, it, it's, I'll probably play with it on my own to see what I can do. I mean, it okay. can still be extra rows and just some of them aren't functional. That's kind of, yeah. Know, if it's two rows of 18 and yeah. only six of the last row are useful, that's. That's just right. the programmer's problem. So, <laughs> and you, you're not going to use, you're not going to draw shapes or anything in those rows, right? They're really no. just, so they're just, you're just going to turn them on and off or something. So, I mean, the idea of making it like a NeoPixel string or something is kind of, you could present it as that also, but that's pretty complicated probably internally. So, I mean, you could, in the same way that you're passing a giant array for the mapping, you could also pass like a list of, bytes yeah like a secondary yeah for tertiary like, type right like however many pixel buffs you want of that view of this thing and those bytes tell you the, the rgb numbers for the things that you're going to treat as a pixel buff because i'm just worried that like what if you're what if you're going to want to treat it like use the led animations but also have display io going like uh, yeah, actually, the, using the pixel buff is and passing something in for there is interesting. I'll take a look at that. I think that is probably what you're gonna want. I agree with Dan that like there is something interesting about like saying like s pixels have special values in a particular spot, like in the frame buffer, but that's not gonna make it easy for people to use the L the existing LED animations that they probably just want on the rings. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I'll take a look at that and see what I can do. Because that, that's an interesting idea. And then if it can be passed in, and then the, the driver just sort of manages. Right, and you can default it to nothing. So that for the like regular and just grid thing. Yeah. And we're going to want like what you're talking about, like basic helper libraries on top of this, just to do the basic initialization for a particular device. Yeah, that's what I was figuring. And so, like, it's not like people are going to really need to manage these weird byte arrays that do all these mappings. It's, like, very similar to the way that, like, we have very light wrappers for all the e-ink initialization stuff. And all the display initialization stuff. Like, yeah. Sounds okay. like you're on the right track. Okay. That, that's good. I, I sort of had some thoughts, but I just wanted to make sure it was matching what you guys as well thought yeah i'll take a look i'll take a look in the next couple hours too to yeah to look on um here and the only other thing is i've only been able to test this on the eyeglass because that's what i've got so if anyone's got any other devices they want to run it on and let me know how it works that's great okay okay all right well thanks for that's the it. discussion thanks a lot okay so that wraps up this uh, edition of the CircuitPython weekly meeting. Uh, next meeting is next Monday, again at 2 p.m. 
Eastern, 11 a.m. Central U.S. time. Um, this, this meeting will be up on YouTube in a little while and also on podcast services. Hopefully the recording has come out fine. All right. Uh, anything else that anybody would like to get into the recording right now? If not, I will stop recording.